Hey you guys, I'm here. Um, we're going to be talking about writing your first smart contract on Sorbonne today. Um, let's start at the beginning though. So we'll do a bit of an intro, we'll talk about what is Sorbonne, why is Sorbonne important, um, a couple awesome demos in there uh, for you to talk about how you can get involved, and a little bit of some personal reflection on it towards the end. We're going to help with that. Uh, so who am I? Uh, so I'm Paul, I'm a staff engineer at the Stellar Development Foundation. Uh, I get to work on Sorbon uh, pretty much every day, which is really exciting. So I'm here today to be sharing some of the stuff that I've been working on over the last year and a bit. What is the Stellar Development Foundation? You've probably been seeing the branding everywhere at the event. So the SDF works with the Stellar community to build the Stellar Network. What is the Stellar Network? It's a fast and reliable L1 blockchain with finality in five seconds. Uh, it's been live since 2015, and it's seen sustained real-world usage up to 150 transactions per second with literally no problem, just cruising along with everything, completely normal. And probably most importantly, it has access to a global network of what we call anchors, um, or on and off ramps, issuing on-chain versions of assets, including cash access in over 200 countries worldwide. And for the last year, we've been building something new, Sorbonne. Sorbonne is a new add-on to the Stellar Network. So traditionally, uh, Vanilla, Stellar, Vanilla Stellar Network did not have smart contracts. Uh, there were a few L2 attempts like turrets uh, you might be familiar with, but they had some issues. Uh, so what is to open up to a more decentralized innovation on the network? I get that um, And to open up new opportunities to the underserved and unbanked populations that Stellar was built to serve. We announced the project uh, that would come to be known as Sorbon back in January of last year. Since then, we've done seven iterative releases uh, onto our experimental testnet, test net known as FutureNet. Uh, this enables devs to experiment, learn, and contribute to the design discussions that we're having. We regularly host design discussions on uh, our Discord, uh, which you should join there. And we've been running a program called Sorbonathon, uh, which you'll hear a bit more about later. And I think really the community interactions have been the best bit of this whole process, right? Um, the community has informed almost everything about the design, uh, from naming to off to how Sorbonne should integrate with the existing Vanilla Stellar network. Uh, and you're all in the community now. I'm sorry. I don't make the rules, but I will enforce them. So you're now in the Stellar community. And about Sorbonne itself, how does it work, right? It's not tightly coupled to the Stellar Network, but it is designed to work well. There, there we go. Oh, hey, all right. Um, so it's not tightly coupled to the network, but it is designed to work with the network very well. It's written end-to-end -end in Rust for speed, efficiency, and access to the ecosystem. The smart contracts are written in WebAssembly, so they can be written in anything that compiles to WebAssembly, but we're prioritizing Rust now because that's where our expertise is so we can give the best experience. It comes with plug-and-play SDKs for all sorts of stuff. Simple authentication, complex authentication, storage. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And it's got to be built to scale, right? Because it's got to keep up with the rest of the network. It can't slow down the network. The thing I'm most excited about with Sorbonne is seeing how it's enabling all of you in the community uh, now that you can build on Stellar completely unchained. Woo! Woo! I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Tyler said if I didn't make that joke, he would fire me, so um, I had to go. So, with that done, at this point, I would like to introduce Morgan onto the stage. Uh, he's the founder of UseSorbonne.app. He's a community member, uh, and he's been building some incredible stuff to help onboard other devs uh, to Sorbonne, and he's going to show us a bit of what he's been working on. Uh, thank you, Paul, hey, everyone. Um, so, like Paul mentioned, I'm going to do a bit of a demo here. And the demo is, uh, uh, wait, let me just download Docker real quick. No, we're not going to download Docker. Who wants to do Docker? We're web developers mostly. Um, there's 10, 20 million of us out there. We want to get started immediately. So um, Paul mentioned this is uh, based on Rust. So how do we do? Um, how do we do a simple Hello World program? Because as developers, that's the first thing that we do, right? We start our programming journeys by writing that uh, canonical phrase, Hello World, um, using that language. And in fact, it's the time that it takes for a developer to get to that point it can be a determining factor to whether they will stick around 
And uh, so with that in mind, let's get going since I want you guys to stick around. So this is uh, useswarabon.app. It's online, and if you want to check it out after or during the presentation, feel free to do that. Uh, it's a online playground for Swarabon. So a playground is a little less than IDE, but uh, enough for you to write actual code. Um, it's got an editor um, up, up here in the center, and that's where you write your code. So let's imagine we're Rust developers, and we're writing uh, a contract and our contract is going to do a hello world. So let's get started. Obstruct contract. This contracts are structures um, in sort of line. And then let's write an implementation. This is a live demo, by the way, so you're, you're all welcome for that. Um, so hello is the function, and we're going to do print line as the macro to say hello world. And let's compile this thing. So if the demo guys are with me, and it seems like they are, um, it compiled. Now, we have two more panels, or as I call them, widgets. Uh, to the right of code, we have actions and console. So in the actions bar, right now we should see the function hello, you would think. This is the public interface to the contract, but we don't see anything in here. Um, now, why is that? Um, well, there's a little bit more magic that comes along with Sorbonne, and we need to uh, import the Sorbonne SDK to get started. Um, by the way, this is a, a demo of going from scratch from Rust to Sorbonne. So let's do a quick and easy import Sorbonne SDK, and we're going to import a contract implementation macro. Now, this macro is going to uh, inform this implementation here that whatever this struct is, it's actually a sort of my contract. Now let's compile this again. And, uh, ooh, so we have a couple of errors here. Um, everyone that's familiar with the, the Rust compiler knows how beautiful the error messages are. So my, my goal was to surface them in a way that's really accessible to anyone that's getting started. So right now we have two error messages, some of them are typos, um, but some of them are, are, are pretty important to what Sorbonne does. So now that we've got the typo out of the way, uh, it says that we have a panic implementation duplication here. The reason that is happening is Sorbonne to save space for the contract, because contracts need to be optimized. We need to save every single byte. And the Rust default is that it imports a whole bunch of stuff in the standard library. So unfortunately, uh, we can't do that. We cannot use the standard library, um, so we've got to get rid of that. So this macro gets rid of the standard library, but now we don't have print line available to us. So how do we say hello uh, in our contract? Well, let's imagine that instead of printing something, we're going to return something, and that's going to be the, the hello here. Um, so we have a type here in uh, Sorbonne SDK, it's called symbol. It's a, an efficiently packed uh, alphanumeric format for uh, characters and numbers, and we're just going to use that. So let's pretend that uh, this function here is going to return a symbol, and we're going to initialize the symbol and return it. So we're just going to use short, hello, and compile this. So now that we don't have any errors in here and we've implemented some uh, uh, macros and we've imported the store minus SDK, we still have nothing. Um, and the last bit here that's missing is Sorbon exposes only the public functions in your contract as part of the interface. So let's recompile this and we have something on screen. It's the button. Uh, if we click that, we get a hello. Um, so we got to hello in five minutes from absolute scratch in terms of Rust to Sorbonne. Now this environment is completely simulated in the browser. So there's no setup that needs to happen beforehand. You just sort of launch this URL and you've got yourself in a development environment. Okay, so we have uh, a single function here. Uh, it's printing hello, um, that's really nice. But we wanna say hello to uh, someone specific. So we're gonna add a second function here uh, in the editor. And let's call this function hello2. And you know, let's ask for a name. 
So the name is going to be a symbol, and we're going to we're going to log that uh, hello message. So um, since we can't use print line, we got to use something else. That something else is uh, called log, and it's made available through the Soramine SDK. Uh, so you would use this pretty much like you would use a print line in your uh, Rust uh, code. So here we go. We're going to log a message that says hello, and then a placeholder, and then the name, and then we should be good. Okay, let's go about this. Uh oh. Um, we have a little bit of a problem here. Um, our function takes in a different kind of signature than what we've provided. Um, this is another example of how Sorobon is a little different from uh, other contract languages. And specifically, it's the Sorobon hosted environment. So Sorobon compiles down to WebAssembly. That's good. Uh, but there's a bunch of stuff that is not done in WebAssembly. So your contracts have pointers to the host environment, that's Soravon, that's running in the uh, Stellar um, architecture. And to access those, uh, what we need to provide an environment um, in our function definition here. So we can quickly fix this error by importing environment in, from the SDK. And every single Soravon public interface function takes in an environment as the first argument. Um, so, environment type env. And then log does depend on the environment. So, for example, I'm emulating, use soravon.app is emulating the soravon environment. This means that, well, I'm using the environment, the uh, browser to uh, print these out. So, I'm just going to share a reference. Let's compile this. And boom, we've got another action in here. So hello still works. And now hello2 asks us for a name. So let's do hello morning. Prince. Um, so just to explain the console a little bit, this blue line here um, is the function that we're calling. Anything in between this and the return uh, indicated by the left chevron is what we call logs. And the log outputs can be as complex as you want um, or as simple as you want. And we can go ahead and change this to pairs. And if we want to call this and debug it using the same arguments, we can just tap the left hand side of this. Uh, don't need to provide anything. This is pretty fast. I'm actually calling this contract. I have to wait for nothing. Or if I need another argument, I can go ahead and, uh, and tap on the ellipses and I'll bring that up. The last part about the uh, product here is the sharing capability or the tester uh, interface. So as developers, we're pretty used to the desktop environment and we make good apps for the desktop. But the mobile side is a little trickier than that. So to enable people to build good apps, good decentralized apps for the mobile, there's a mobile version. So I would appreciate it if people in the audience just scan this QR code and loaded it up through their phones. And uh, let's see what, uh, what we'll get. All right, so if this thing opened, um, you will have a sheet underneath that says actions, and it's gonna include a couple of buttons. And if you tap on the button, uh, your phone should have a console in there um, that's logging these outputs. And if you click on hello too, it can provide your name click confirm, and then you got that going. And uh, so that's my greeting from you guys, uh, from, from Sorobot to, to you guys. And um, with that little demo, I'm gonna hand it off back to Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Where did my notes go? There's my notes. Uh, okay, so that's kind of a basic intro to Soroban, uh, but I want to talk about what makes Soroban so special uh, and why I think it's going to be the best developer experience for smart contracts. So there's three things that go into it. First off, we've aimed for it to be very batteries included for devs. So everything from storage to authentication to token minting and to transfers is all baked in and ready to go. Uh, it means you can focus on your application and not spend ages trying to figure out like how to verify an ED25519 signature, like all this like nonsense you get into when you're trying to write a complicated app, right? 
Um, secondly, it gives you access to all of the existing assets on the Stellar network already. Um, from day one of launch, your smart contracts can hold and use uh, Circle USDC, right, and all the other assets on the chain. Um, they have access to Stellar's cash on and off ramps via a partnership with MoneyGram in over 200 countries worldwide. If we put this together, uh, we could look at someone like, let's say, Julia, so-called. Uh, she doesn't have a bank account, right? But she can go to her local MoneyGram location. She can deposit cash into a kiosk. She gets the USDC in her wallet on the Stellar network. And now, with Sorbon, she can take that USDC and deposit it into whatever you guys are building, right? A lot of different stuff. Um, let's say for this, an income generating DeFi protocol where she receives a portion of transaction fees for providing liquidity. Uh, that's a new opportunity that's available to her that isn't today. Um, the partnership between Stellar's Anchor Network and MoneyGram allows users like Julia to move cash straight from their physical real wallet to a DeFi protocol and vice versa, which is something that's never really been seen on any other blockchain network so far. And the third one, uh, I'm an engineer, so this is, I'll probably spend the most time talking about this because I'm excited, is the scaling optimizations we've done. Um, when designing Sorbonne, you know, we've been able to learn from the state of the art across the networks now and handpick the best pieces from each. Uh, so we've designed the transaction execution model so it can be parallelized across multiple cores. Um, we've worked on calibrating the fee model so you get better throughput and minimize the cost while protecting the existing Stellar Network payments traffic. And we've designed a lot of optimizations around the contracts themselves. So, for example, uh, there's no serialization, deserialization uh, in your contract. If you look at other chains, uh, not to pick on Near, because I love Near, but they do this, you have to add a JSON parser into your contract to parse the arguments to it, right? And that means you need to pay to deploy that, and your users need to pay to run that. So by pushing stuff like that into the host, we can reduce the contract size pretty massively. That's kind of the thing I mean when I say batteries included, right? And it goes further than that with built-in contracts. Um, on other chains, you might know these as kind of pre-compiles. That's like a similar concept. Um, but there's basically pre-baked contracts that can run in the host uh, super fast, super cheap for things like token minting and contracts that happen all the time. Uh, and they can drive standards on the network uh, within the ecosystem. And the last one, uh, I'll mention a little bit here, is we're working on solving the state bloat. Uh, with the uh, state expiration model. So on other chains, you pay to store the data, and that data is there forever. Right? The chain has to hold on to that forever. Uh, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, we have a rent-based system uh, in Sorbonne. Uh, and if you stop paying your rent, you get evicted, uh, and you can pay to restore it if you need that data back. Uh, the trade-off being we can keep the working set for the chain as lean as it possibly needs to be, and keep the chain running good in the future, not just when we launch it. Right? And uh, on storage, I think Morgan has a little demo for us actually on how storage works on Sorbonne. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so going back to use Sorbonne that app, let's go ahead and create a new demo project. All right. Um, so with uh, smart contracts, sooner or later, Every developer finds themselves in a situation where their application is not working as expected. And this particularly relates to state. Uh, we all know the techniques for handling this though. Uh, there's unit testing, logging in event values, using breakpoints to inspect your uh, stat frames, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, smart contract developers um, often don't have rapid workflows for dealing with these uh, issues and finding faults in their contracts, which leaves them with only really one or two options, um, specifically one being constantly having to redeploy their contracts with small tweaks to test nets um, and test against that, or if they're lucky, if the blockchain provides it, um, the network interface to the local Docker instance where they're simulating uh, the network. But that's very cumbersome and then you're still dealing with sending transactions and signing those and um, you're no closer to, to your debugging um, goals. Sorbonne handles uh, some of these challenges head on um, by providing a guest environment. So this whole concept of a host environment um, that executes a lot of this stuff um, and the rest being handled by WebAssembly um, allows for a great developer experience. 
Um, so the uh, guest environment provided in the SDK allows you to do unit tests right in Rust, right against your code, and no compiling necessary, you're just sort of running your Rust uh, contract uh, straight from uh, cargo uh, to run your unit test. So uh, that's a great, great uh, improvement for quality of life for developers. And um, I'm sure you guys will be able to experience it um, uh, by going to the Sorbonne website, looking at the docs, and interacting with the uh, unit tests. It's a big focus uh, for Sorbonne. Uh, with Sorbonne, with usorbonne.app, though, uh, I leveraged this architecture to provide web developers with a debugging experience that is similar, but unlike any other smart contract playground out there. OK? So um, with, with logging uh, and you know, not having to go and interface with a test net, um, all of a sudden things become a lot faster. Okay, so I don't wanna copy paste any code, so just bear with me um, and we're gonna write it out and you can develop a muscle memory for what it is to write um, a smart contract for Sorobot. So we're gonna import uh, the contract implementation, environment, and the symbol, all the tools that we used before. We're going to declare our contract uh, structure. This can be any name, really, but since I'm developing a generic contract, we're going to call it a contract. And then uh, we're going to provide an implementation for this contract uh, using this macro right here and the implementation in Rust. Okay, so what is this contract going to do? Um, I'm going to showcase uh, a, a brief example of storing things and retrieving things on Sorobine. So to store a thing, we're going to have a save function. And to retrieve a thing, we're going to have a load function. Pretty simple, right? And uh, I think we can go ahead and compile this. Oh. We have an error here with the no SDP, but that's an easy fix. All right, so we have two actions here. The don't do anything, maybe return null, because uh, that's the default. It's the implied none return. That's fine. Uh, we don't need that for now. OK, uh, so to store something, I guess we probably should start by um, trying to read it. Uh, like in my previous example, we had the environment as the very first argument in these functions, and storage is handled by the environment. So we're not storing anything directly in WebAssembly. We're storing it with the Sorbonne host environment. So that's going to be the first argument here. And what do we do? Well, we go into environment and go into storage, and then we get. Now what do we get? We get a key. So it's a key value store, um, and we need some sort of a key reference um, object to, to work with, so I'm going to declare a constant storage key, and it's going to be just, I don't know, I couldn't come up with anything clever, so it's going to be a storage key. Okay, so we're going to pass the reference to that, and then let's compile this. It should be good. It's not. Um, it's not because uh, Sorbonne um, stores values without really um, confirming, like we're, we're storing raw values. So in the, in the, in the client site, we have to do um, an unwrap for an option, whether the value is there or not, and another unwrap for a result, um, which checks whether the value converts properly to what we expect. And uh, let's go ahead and return symbol from this function. So we do storage, get, and unwrap a bunch. And then we get a trap. So this is all um, in the browser. We're not interfacing with uh, anything on the network, but we get traps. So uh, when reading from storage when no, no value is present, um, we get an error because you know uh, we did a whole bunch of unwrapping without safety checks. Um, so I'll just implement the save function uh, to put something in there so that this trap no longer traps. Uh, and we're going to store, what are we going to store? Let's store a name. So environment is the first argument, the name is the second one, and uh, store that. Let's sweep and pop. Okay, so save, uh, store Paris, returns null, 
that's fine. And then load, loads periods. So that worked. <laughs> this is a live demo, by the way. I'm surprised it works myself. Okay, uh, so now that we've got this basic storage uh, functionality uh, out the way, uh, we put uh, things into storage using the set, uh, and we get items from storage using get, but we make sure that we unwrap the values so that we're getting the right thing from there. Okay. So now let's uh, let's add a little more um, uh, functionality here, and I'm going to take this uh, regular storage for uh, a symbol and uh, make an increment. So something that actually refers back to the state that we had before. So I'm going to implement a get num function. This is going to you know take the regular environment value and return a, an integer value. Uh, the integer value is going to be uh, on sign, so we'll go from zero to whatever the biggest value there uh, can be. So we'll go to storage, get, and we're using the same key. Um, we don't have to worry about um, recycling things because you know, this gets uh, deleted after every time we can compile this. So we're going to unwrap, but this time we're going to do it safely. All right. If there's no value in there. We will start with uh, zero. Let's compile this. And get num, return zero, there's nothing on the storage. Cool. So that's one side of uh, our contract. The other one is the increment function. And it's going to take an environment value and return 32. It doesn't have to return anything, um, but it's going to be good for debugging. So what do we do? Well. I'm going to be, be a little lazy here, and I'm going to copy the getter part, and we're going to get a number that's currently present in the contract. And, uh, well, to increment something, how do we do that? Age old question. We do plus one. And then we return the number. Okay? This looks good. This looks good. I think this should work. Let's remove uh, the old code here. two actions that are actually appropriate here. So get num, we get a zero. That's fine. Increment, we increment it by one. So this looks good. This looks promising. We already have one in here. So if I click this a lot of times, it'll go up in, in, in number, right? Uh-oh. It's still one. That's bad. I, I messed up somewhere. Um, wait a sec. I have to deploy to testnet again, sign this. No. In this environment, I have to log and see the values, and that's it. I don't need to worry about the network. So let's do before, and uh, before this number is whatever, and then after. Uh, so we'll see what, what happens, what, what changes. Um, oh, log, we didn't import log. Let's go ahead and fix that. Okay, um, so let's go increment. Before it was zero, after it is one. We'll do this again. Before it is also zero, but after it's one. See? So the problem is, it's. I don't think I'm changing the value. I don't think I'm putting anything in the storage. Um, and you know, that's right. Uh, I knew this ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's easier to debug this way. When we have logs and we have access to rapid fire iterations, and like, oh, I want to add a log here and there, and rerun it real quick. Um, I can do that. With Soravon allows us to do that with these developing tools that it enables. Okay, so let's really quickly change this. We're gonna set, all right, so when we're getting a value from storage, we're gonna put it back. We're gonna do storage and number. Okay, do you think this will work? Do you think this fixes it? Raise a hand. If you, if you think it's fixed. Oh, okay. We've got a lot of developers in the, in the audience. One, two, three, here we go. So, we fixed it. I knew how to fix it, but if, you know, to, to grab a hint for how to fix it, logging provided that. And, um, you know, it's invaluable to developers, especially to JavaScript developers. We use console log a lot. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's a great example of it. 
Um, I still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to complicate my life even more by storing increment values per individual, right? And we all know that dealing with accounts and addresses on the blockchain, it's not that easy, right? A typical account address is like, what, 32 characters or whatever it is, and it's got a whole bunch of numbers and letters and characters, and it's not easy to reference uh, things like, I sent this to that and whatever. Uh, so we're, I'm gonna demo the interacting with addresses as well as part of this. Okay, so we have uh, our get number, so we're gonna add a second argument here, and uh, we're gonna get number for a specific user. Users are, uh, oh, sorry. Users are uh, indicated by the address type. And uh, all right, so how do we handle this? Well, first, I think we're going to store everything in a map. Okay, a map is uh, a dictionary or you know, a key value pair, a hash map. Um, it's got many names. So we're going to store this in a map. This kind of, we're going to call it numbers. And the type here is going to be map, key is going to be address, and the value is going to be U32 number. So you know, we're adding some complications here. Now, when we unwrap for a value that's not there, potentially, we've got to do something better here than zero. Uh, so we're going to use the map uh, macro and initialize an empty map using the environment. Everything that's a complex data type, like a map or a vector, everything's stored with the host environment. We're just sort of getting references to those things um, in the client. All right, uh, so we already did a bunch of stuff, and we're getting tired. Let's log this thing. So you know, the mantra is log often, as often as you can. And uh, yeah, we're going to do that. So we're going to log. We're going to log the numbers map and maybe the user as well. Why not? Okay, and uh, we turn zero for now for so that this compiles. Okay, get num. Ooh, so instead of having to provide a long uh, series of digits and characters and letters, uh, use for Avon uses an abstraction since it's emulating the entire environment in the browser. And we can just select Alex, Bart, or Kelly to indicate our account. Um, and that's as easy as that. And it's easy to reference as a developer. Oh, like I had everything stored with Alex. Why does Bart have all my money? Um, so, all right. We call this, we get an empty map, and we have Alex in there. Printed in the console, we return zero because that was the fixed number there. Okay, uh, so let's move forward. Numbers.get, and we're going to get based on the user. And we're going to unwrap four. So this is, again, going back to the integers. So if no values in the map associated with that user, we're going to return zero. And let's unwrap it and uh, recompile it. OK, get number zero, zero, zero. All right, so that's getting them adjusted to accept users and have increment values per user. All right, so now let's uh, modify or refactor our increment function. So it's going to take a user, and and uh, that's going to be an address. Now, there's going to be a bit of copy paste right here for the numbers map, since this is a map. Oh, I can turn some of these off to give me some more space, make it easier to read. All right, so now that we have numbers, We've got to fetch the number. So the mutable number is what is it? It's numbers dot get user dot clone and then unwrap or okay zero unwrap and uh, I think that's good. So now number is whatever this is. We're going to log it before and after. And what are we storing? Um, what are we storing inside? So we're storing numbers, and we're going to set the user value to, to be the number. Okay? And we're 
scoring on first backwards. And this guy is going to be the number that we just implemented. Oh no. Um, oh yeah. This needs to be moved. Okay. So let's increment Alex. We got one, two, three. Okay, let's select Bart. By the way, when we call, we have functions with a lot of arguments. So Felix can be tedious to input all of those arguments again and again and again. So you sort of on that app remembers the last sequence of arguments and you can click to the left hand side the name and it's just gonna you know use the same arguments over and over. If you want to modify there's the ellipses you can click and then that's gonna change your focus and bring back the modal. So we have incremented a bunch of stuff. So let's try to see Alex. It's got three. Oh and we even have a, a log here to neatly displays Alex as 3, or it's 12, Callie has 2. And this is a complicated use of storage. And like before, I invite everyone to whip out their phones and uh, scan this app and see if you can interact with it. It's going to be an action sheet at the bottom, and you'll get that uh, account selector on your phone. It's really important to test your contracts on your phone. You get a good sense for your audience, because guess what? Most people consume crypto on their phones. It's not, it's not a MetaMask uh, desktop thing anymore. All right, um, so, if, by the way, I didn't ask before. Is this working on your phones? I see one hand up. Oh, a lot of hands, all right. <laughs> so last night compiling was good. I didn't, I didn't ruin anything. All right, so with that, I conclude my demo and hand it off to uh, Tyler, who's gonna talk about the initiatives, and, uh, all the funding. Cool. Thank you. All right. Just a quick introduction to myself. My name is Tyler Vanderhoeven. I'm an ecosystem engineer at the uh, Solar Development Foundation. Uh, a lot of what I focus on is top of funnel education. So helping people now learn Rust, learn Soroban. Um, but today I'd like to talk about $100 million. It's a, it's a part of our adoption fund. So you've kind of seen how we're, how we're building out applications, how you can use Soroban to build out contracts. I'm sure your minds hopefully are already beginning to, to think of all the ways that you might like to, to use it for your own services, products, tools. Uh, and to support that, we've got, to, we've got three programs. The first one is, uh, is Stellar Quest. This is a, it's kind of my baby. Um, really top of funnel. We're, we're using Stellar Quest as a lot of course material, education initiatives. We've got a Soroban course, kind of takes you from zero to, to hero, knowing how the, the Soroban ecosystem uh, works. You can win NFTs, collect NFTs to prove how Sorbonneized you are. Um, this is just going to be a really good place. If your team is new, if you yourself are new, send them here. They can learn uh, both about classic Stellar, so if you've got a lot of these assets that are issued on, on the Stellar side or looking to port them over, we kind of cover the, the whole spectrum from a, from a very beginner-friendly uh, point of view. Next up is uh, the Sorbonne-a-thon. This is actually where, uh, where Morgan came through uh, initially, I think only just three months ago. Unbelievable. Uh, this is, a, so if you're a tinker, individual indie dev, kind of just looking to play around, uh, maybe not sure if you want to commit quite yet. This is a little bit lower dollar, right around thousand to five grand for an experiment, a project. Uh, maybe you want to port over some open Zeppelin contracts, or um, just looking to, to experiment. Maybe do a comparative analysis between what are the contract size differences between uh, other L ones. Just a good place to get a uh, kind of moonlight to, to become familiar with, experiment with with Soramon. So that's a, that's another great site, kind of the next level after you've learned and are beginning to build. Our final program that I'd like to highlight is our is our seller community fund. So this is for really uh, entrepreneurs, people that are trying to build out businesses, um, that have a real idea for something sustainable that they want to keep alive. Uh, this is a, a max check size of about 150 grand um, that we're cutting out. Not, no, no strings attached, it's not an investment, it's a grant, an opportunity for you to take whatever ideas or projects, protocols you've got uh, that you want to bring on over to Sarabon. There's an application flow, and we try and keep this running very regularly, so make sure to, to hop on over to that. That's really our our flow that we're trying to take people on for, for learning, experimenting, and then actually um, building out full-fledged applications. I am, I'm 
wicked excited about Stormont. I've been with Stellar since 2014. Um, that's a, that was a long time ago. And uh, I've, I've always missed that they, they didn't have smart contract functionality. I always wanted to do way more than it could do traditionally. What it has is amazing. And it's very important that it has these functions very secure and fast and stable. We're not getting rid of any of that, but we're adding on this second lane for innovation, this Turing complete, do whatever you want, make it crazy type of initiative. But both of these lanes are so critically important for actually building things that change the world. To see the slow, steady progress of getting this very stable, very secure lane where there's real world assets and now tagging on to that, this innovation layer of, but I want to do something crazy, is now supported. I think it's the, the right way to build, and, uh, and here we are. With that, though, I, I think I'm going to hand it back off to, uh, to Morgan to talk a little bit. Like, like I said, three months ago, Morgan comes into the ecosystem, and in just that short amount of time, all the demo stuff that you see is things that he's been able to build on this, this service that's not even live yet, right? We've got this future net. Probably about six months or so, we're actually going to hit main net. There's this very unique, relatively short period of time that we have to kind of jump on top of something new, but this isn't a new chain. We're not having to bootstrap liquidity. All of that asset, all of that value that's already on the Stellar chain, immediately on day one, available on Sarbon. And I think as developers begin to recognize that, like Morgan, they just start building and they go crazy. So I'm going to have you back. Tyler, that was beautiful. Um, it is crazy to think that it's been only three months uh, since I uh, found out about Soravine. So a little, little background. Um, my developer journey uh, started as a kid with a fascination with computers. I was 14 when I wrote my first line of code, and for me that experience informed what I was going to do from that point onward. Uh, and I've made a career out of it. Almost 20 years of uh, frustration followed with joy of seeing something you've built come to life. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I feel that this industry is not focused enough on the joy of building while providing ample frustration, if we're honest about it. Over the last two years, I've tried playing around with a few smart contract platforms, spending a considerable amount of time on two of them. And in the end, I felt like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz in a conversation with a scarecrow and Tin Man, trying to figure out why one had no brain and the other one had no heart. Um, and in my frustration, uh, I continued looking for a platform that, that had both a brain and a heart. And then just last November, I found Soravon. Uh, I took part in the very first Soravonathon, like Tyler mentioned. It was called First Light. And, um, I found out about Soravon, I found out about XDR, the data exchange uh, 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 type, and then I started getting into Rust. And mind you, I've never done anything Rust related, so doing that without any prior experience. And then lastly, WebAssembly was the thing uh, I learned. So my first projects were simple, mostly to do with optimizations of one development workflow or another, as most developers do. And it was a blast. Um, and the community on Discord was awesome and made it that much better. And I encourage everyone in this room to go on Discord and, and join the Stellar uh, Sorbonne Discord. My final project as part of Sorbonnethon was a browser tool for interacting with the Sorbonne RPC, something that a lot of developers do with a lot of these chains. And I wanted to build a great developer experience for anyone building and testing their contracts that can be really frustrating, and, and especially if you're going in, in code and command line, that can be tricky. So, spending countless hours and trying to find that great experience, that great developer experience, and working on various parts of the stack, from the WASM executable to the host environment, I realized something. And I realized that I had everything I needed to build a self-contained browser environment for executing and testing Soravine contracts. And seeing how coupling WebAssembly, the virtual machine, and uh, the Soravine host environment spec enabled me to build a browser-based developer tool was like my aha moment. 
I could not do this with any other stack, with any other platform. And now I can build tools that require no setup, no Docker, no command line, no nothing, just an internet connection and a browser. And that's millions of other people that are used to that setup. So after Sorbonne, I thought I'd continue taking part in the Sorbonne community uh, on Discord, on Twitter. By the way, if you want to follow me, I'm at uh, Sorbonne Dev on Twitter. And just last month, I applied uh, for the Stellar Community Fund grant program to help me build the smart uh, contract playground of my dreams, which I had the pleasure of uh, downloading today. And all of this happened, like Tyler said, in the span of uh, a little over three months. So needless to say, my experience uh, so far has been stellar. And I would urge uh, everyone in this audience uh, to consider joining the Sorbonne community. And uh, there's a bunch of uh, cool folks on there, uh, on Discord and on Twitter. And uh, yeah, open arms. Everyone's welcome. And I'll hand it off back to Paul. Thank you. Cool. That's it. That's all we have for you today. Um, you're in the community now. Go build stuff. Uh, I think smart contracts are going to bring a ton of exciting new use cases and innovation to Stellar. Uh, for me personally, right, like I'm an engineer, I'm excited about the tech, you know, like what can I say? Um, you know, I could say that Sorbonne allows to bridge the disconnect between developers and people on the fringes of financial inclusion, right? Or we could say that there's a load of chances to learn and tinker and build and earn rewards with the adoption fund programs like Tyler was talking about. Um, but what I will say, is that I hope the experimentation that we're all doing will lead to building real businesses, real projects, and real world use cases on Sorbonne to help further financial inclusion. So if that excites you the same way it does me, then my job's done. I can go take a nap, that's great. Um, but if you're excited about this, you can start experimenting with Sorbonne now. Uh, it's live on the Experiment Testnet Futurenet. Um, you know, play with it. See where you can fit in when it launches for realsies later this year to mainnet. Um, join the Discord. There's a uh, link here, QR code to there. It's all, everything's linked on there. That'll help you keep up with development and find out where things are going. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, I can't wait to see what you build. Uh, I don't know if we have time for Q and A, uh, but we'll be just outside just after if you have questions for us. Thank you very much. Woo!